two years. Last week, it was two years, 102 years, since the Austro-Hungarian Empire declared war on Serbia and all of this started. But it was 100 years ago this week that the warring nations analyzed the war effort. I'm Indy Nidell. Welcome to the Great War. Last week at the Somme, the British managed to take Longueval and Delville Wood, though they began the week with disastrous, uncoordinated attacks there. The Russians lost big in the north, but continued winning big in the south and in Anatolia. Two years and six days since the war began, on July 29th, British Commander-in-Chief Sir Douglas Haig received a letter from Sir William Robertson, Chief of the Imperial General Staff. It was about the Battle of the Somme and warned him that the powers that be are beginning to get a little uneasy in regard to the situation. They wonder whether a loss of, say, 300,000 men will lead to really great results, because if not, we ought to be content with something less than we are doing now. They also pointed out that the primary objective, the relief of pressure on the French at Verdun, had to a certain extent already been achieved. But Haig was adamant that the Somme would continue, figuring that within six weeks the Germans would run out of men under steady offensive pressure. Still, on the 30th, the British at Guillemont repeated their mistake of last week, that of not recognizing the new German tactic of having machine gunners in shell holes clear of the trenches. As before, they advanced into the village. As before, they were driven out at huge cost by flanking machine guns. An example of that cost was the 2nd Royal Scots Fusiliers. Of 770 men who went in, 120 returned. As August began, it seems clear, with hindsight, that the British command did not grasp that the situation was very different now than it was in early or even mid-July. Small, bludgeoning attacks that were successful at the beginning of the battle would no longer gain ground. The Germans were well organized with a coherent, cohesive defense. Also, much of their defense points, unlike earlier, were out of sight of direct artillery observation. Generally bad weather prevented the British from using their air superiority and, certainly according to the gunners themselves, the wear on the big guns prevented the accuracy required for wide-scale creeping barrages. And, as I've said, the British still didn't understand the change in machine gun tactics around Guillemont. This all added up. British prospects in August at the Somme looked pretty grim when you think about it. And things still looked grim for Austria-Hungary to the east. On the 28th, the Russian offensive renewed itself along most of the line and it smashed through the Austro-German defenses all along the line. On just that day, the Austrian 4th Army lost 15,000 men, 60% of its force, and 90 machine guns. Timothy Dowling in the Brusilov Offensive writes, in truth, it was quite simply a general lack of fighting spirit on the part of the Habsburg troops that had caused the catastrophe. Nearly two-thirds of the 4th Army's losses had been taken prisoner, often with minimal fighting. But that attack against the 4th Army was actually only a diversion. The Russian 3rd Army and Guards Army were driving towards Colville, straight from the east, but the July rains had made the Central Powers line at the Stockhard River formidable, and the Russians, despite early successes, could not cross that line and took enormous casualties. Although you can kind of understand it in the face of heavy losses and tough terrain, the failure of Russian General Alexei Brusilov's commanders to coordinate and follow up successes was as costly as it had been in mid-June. Alexei Kaladin, after smashing the 4th Army the 28th, didn't do much at all the 29th, which allowed the enemy time to bring up German reserves and organize defenses. When the attack was renewed the 30th, those reserves made the difference and the lines held. Further south, General Platon Leschitsky did not attack with his 9th Army, even under pressure from Brusilov and the Stavka, and the Central Powers had time to reorganize there as well. Once the Carpathian Corps had arrived in Bukovina August 1st, the Central Powers thought that they could not only hold the mountain passes, but even successfully counterattack. Much as the British successfully counterattacked this week, after being attacked by the Ottoman forces at Romani in North Sinai. In fact, the British counterattack drove the Ottomans back 30 kilometers. So that was the main action this week, the carnage at the Somme continuing, everybody regrouping on the Eastern Front, the Turkish attack and the Sinai, 
But something else happened this week. This week, 102 years ago, Germany, France, Russia, Belgium, and Great Britain joined the war. For the second anniversary of the war, Collier's Weekly, a major American magazine at the time, got statements from the British, French, and German foreign offices about the state of the war. The British simply said they have no change in policy from the beginning of the war. The French said a day of justice is coming, but they also said the following, which I find very interesting. The war was declared on France by the Germans on the 3rd of August 1914 for such frivolous motives as shelling by her arrows of places as distant as Nuremberg, an imaginary deed of which she never dreamt, which she has never been able to duplicate, and which an inspection of the local newspapers has proved to have passed unmentioned by them. Now, that is something I'd never heard before, that Germany claimed it went to war with France because France bombed Nuremberg. If anybody has heard this before and has any more info, send it to us. The Germans had much more to say to Colliers, and here's their piece written by Baron Mumm von Schwarzenstein from the Foreign Office in Berlin. In order to appreciate what Germany has accomplished during two years of war, one has to recall to mind the great expectations which her enemies had attached to this war, into which their powerful coalition, after years of political scheming and thorough military preparations, had enmeshed the prosperous empire. At the outset, the avowed purpose of Germany's enemies was to annihilate her, her army, her fleet, her commerce, and her industry. France hoped to regain Alsace-Lorraine. Russia expected to conquer the provinces of East and West Prussia and Posen, which probably were to receive the blessings of Russian culture. Austria-Hungary was to be dismembered. The Balkan states were to be rendered tributary to the Tsar. Constantinople and the Dardanelles were to be added to the Romanov's dominions. As for England, she deliberately entered this war because she thought she would run small risk. The world will remember the vainglorious way in which Germany's enemies foretold that before long their armies would meet in the heart of Germany, where Cossacks would parade the streets of Berlin and Indian lancers and Gurkhas would stroll through the parks of Potsdam. Germany would soon be paralyzed, nay, would soon be passing away. Such were the expectations of the enemies, attacking us from all sides. Germany was drawn into a war of self-defense, and today, how do matters stand? Accepting one small corner of the empire, the only enemies on German soil are vast numbers of prisoners of war. The war is fought on enemy soil. Germany and her allies occupy three independent kingdoms. They hold vast areas of enemy territory in East and West. They hold these territories firmly and without fear of losing them by force of arms. Consider the efforts our enemies have made on the West Front. In their unsuccessful attempts at Luce and in Champagne last autumn, they suffered terrible losses and made no headway. In the spring, Germany took up the offensive against Verdun. Step by step, we are steadily gaining ground. The French positions are crumbling away one by one. Thanks to the genius of Hindenburg, East Germany is no longer threatened by Russia. Last year, in cooperation with our valiant ally Austria-Hungary, we drove back the Russians, overwhelming their armies. For the last two months, it is true, the Russians have resumed the offensive, but they have not succeeded in breaking through our lines. Our enemies attain nothing but terrible losses. They achieve but little substantial gain. They have, in no material way, damaged our position on the Western Front. Our enemies will probably realize in time that they are biting on granite. Germany awaits the outcome of the present combined offensive with calmness and confidence. Then her turn may come once more. The Allies have been rejoicing over the collapse of Germany. Repeatedly, it has been postponed. Germany enters the third year of the war with unaltered confidence in her final triumph. Germany is fighting against the greatest odds known in history. She is not only fighting against the most powerful combination of enemies, but with a world of prejudice skillfully created against her. Happy birthday. This war is not even close to over. If you're actually curious about the team behind our show and you want to know more about how we produce the show, you can check out our behind the scenes right here. Our Patreon supporter of the week is Haran Montagnola. 
Help us out on Patreon to make us more independent from ad revenue. Like us on Facebook to learn even more about the First World War. See you next time.